Now I have the great pleasure of introducing you to our speaker today, Louise Pichel, Assistant Archivist at the Museum of Freemasonry. And we are going back to school uh, with Louise as she takes us through some records of the Masonic schools. And Louise, we're looking so much forward to this. I will hand over to you. Thanks for the introduction, Jane. Hi, everybody. One of the main things I love about being an archivist is that behind every beige, possibly legible rectangle of paper, there's a story waiting to be found. Nowhere is this more obvious than in the records of the Royal Masonic Schools for Girls and Boys, more formally known as the Royal Masonic Institution for Girls, the RMIG, and the Royal Masonic Institution for Boys, the RMIB. In this talk, I'm going to introduce you to a few of the school's pupils whose stories range from maritime tragedy to clandestine cheese thievery, as well as giving you an idea of how you might go about uncovering your own stories in the collections. But before we start delving into the stores, it's worth telling you a little something of the school's histories. The origin of the Masonic schools lies with this chap on the left, Chevalier Bartholomew Ruspini. I won't go into too much detail about his fascinating please, life. Wait, could you share your screen, please, so we can see the PowerPoint? Sorry to interrupt you. Of course. <laughs> See, this is what happens when I do it all. Right. <laughs> That's perfectly all right. There we go. I'll start again. Perfect. Thank you. We can see it now. Thank you. Brilliant. Sorry about that, everybody. Okay. So. So. This chap on the left, Chevalier Bartholomew Ruspini. Um, I won't go into too much detail about his life uh, as my colleague Susan will have much more to say about him in a future talk. Suffice it to say, he was a very keen Freemason who first suggested the idea of forming a school for the daughters of Freemasons in 1788. The school was the first central charity formed outside the control of the Grand Lodge. And by November of 1788, they had raised enough funds to purchase a property in Summers Place East, between where Euston and Paddington stations are today. The charismatic Ruspini had managed to interest the Grand Master, the Duke of Cumberland, and his wife Anne in the project, pictured on the slide on the right, and they agreed to be patrons of the school. This patronage was reflected in the original name of the school, the Royal Cumberland School for Daughters of Indigent Freemasons. And the name survives on some of our oldest records for the girls' school. I'll come back to those in a bit. The girls' school rapidly expanded, and by 1795, land had been purchased at St George's Fields, now Westminster Bridge Road, where the first purpose-built school was constructed. This engraving is how it would have looked in 1803. As the school, by now known as the Royal Masonic Institution for Girls, continued to expand and admit yet more girls, it moved to the borders of Clapham and Wandsworth Common, adding a junior school by 1888. Here it is, pictures on a ticket for a fundraising festival from 1860. In 1917, the junior school moved to Weybridge, as an aside, I've had a fair few inquiries from people whose relatives had very fond memories of their time there. And by 1934, a new senior school had been built on a site in Rickmansworth Park, where the school still stands today. The boys' school has a different charismatic Freemason to thank for its foundation. Sir Francis Columbine Daniel is another man worthy of a talk in his own right. He was also a keen Freemason who trained as a surgeon and an apothecary and is perhaps most well known for his invention of the life preserver or air jacket. Less well known, but I think worthy of a slight detour here, is his status as quite possibly the only man in history to accidentally receive a knighthood. In a very British turn of events, the story goes that whilst attending a levee at Buckingham Palace in 1820, Daniel ended up getting in the wrong queue and found himself with a sword on his shoulder when he got to the end of it. Once the deed had been done, there was no undoing it. 
and when he next appears in newspapers of the period, it is as Sir F.C. Daniel. So back to the schools. In 1808, before accidental knighthoods, Daniel and fellow members of Royal Naval Lodge number 59 were the first to suggest the formation of a boys' charity to support the sons of distressed Freemasons. Notice I use the word charity here rather than schools. Initially, the idea was that boys would be supported in their education through funds provided by the boys' charity, rather than through a specific Masonic school for boys. The charity continued supporting boys in this way until 1857, when they finally decided to build a physical school. Here it is. It was located in Wood Green and was home to the Sons of Freemasons until 1902. In that year, the school relocated to Bushy in Hertfordshire, and in 1927, the school expanded to include a junior school. The two schools merged in 1970, and as the Royal Masonic Institution for Boys switched its focus back towards providing grants for education, the school eventually closed in 1977. Now the history lessons finished, on to the collections themselves. The museum looks after the school collections on behalf of the Masonic Charitable Foundation, the MCF, and access to those items has been made possible through cataloguing projects generously funded by the MCF over a number of years. The first thing I should say is that the archive collections relate to the administration of the schools rather than to pupils specifically. So for any past pupils who may be watching tonight, you may be relieved to hear that we don't have copies of your old school reports. What we do have are records such as petitions for entry into the schools, um, mostly for the girls' school. Um, an example uh, is on the right of the slide. Um, we've only got boys' petitions from about the 1970s. Um, we also have admissions registers and committee minutes as well as some photographs and films. The image you can see on the left of the slide is the first girls' school minute book. Note the reference to Royal Cumberland on the cover, a nod to the patrons I mentioned earlier. In all honesty, the records themselves can seem quite dry. There are lots of numbers, dates and statistics, but behind these are very real and occasionally tragic life stories, and it's up to me to be able to bring them out. In this next part of the talk, I'm going to introduce you to some of these life stories, ranging from maritime tragedy to classic schoolboy antics. When I first started at the museum in 2007, I was aware of the existence of records relating to the two Masonic schools. But it wasn't until 2009, when I was responsible for cataloguing petitions for entry into the schools, that I realised just how many stories there were behind these seemingly dull bits of paper. As part of the cataloguing, I worked my way through many boxes of meticulously folded petitions, listing names, dates and reference numbers for all the girls applying for places. When I reached the box of petitions for 1912, I stumbled across a link to one of the most well-known events in history. Written in red across the front of two petitions in the box were the words Titanic case. I'll admit, I was pretty excited. After all, there aren't many people who haven't heard of the Titanic. The petitions I'd found were for twin girls, Eleanor and Florence Hill, whose mother had found herself in difficulty after their father, Henry Parkinson Hill, had perished when the Titanic sank. Henry was a Freemason who had been initiated in Staines Lodge in Middlesex in March 1904, and who had originally worked as a jeweller. The story of how we came to be on the Titanic on that fateful day is a poignant one. Included in Eleanor and Florence's petitions is a letter from the Hill family doctor, Charles Batchelor, concerning Henry's health. In it, Dr. Batchelor describes how Henry suffered from tubercular disease of the lungs, essentially tuberculosis, um, and how he'd given up his business and after a spell in Woking, eventually settled in Brighton, presumably in the hope that the good sea air would improve things. 
the letter goes on to say, and this is the bit that really got to me, that it was Dr. Batchelor himself who suggested that Henry take a voyage, presumably for the restorative sea air. Unable to afford a, to purchase a ticket for such a voyage, in a rather tragic twist of fate, Henry decided to take a job as a steward for the White Star Line. By 1912, he'd moved to Southampton and had worked as a steward on the Olympic before boarding the Titanic on the 4th of April, 1912. Dr. Batchelor's letter ends with a very matter of fact statement that Henry was in that capacity as a steward when he was lost with the Titanic. It was this tragic loss which left his wife Florence unable to support her daughters and petitioning the Masonic Girls' School for help. Aside from the girls' petitions, which are currently on display in our Treasures exhibition, which is available on our website, the other records tell us a bit more about just how important these particular cases were. Hunting through the minutes of the school committees, which are, you'll be relieved to hear, pretty well indexed, I came across references to the receipt of Eleanor and Florence's petitions now, normally, when a petition was received, each applicant would be considered and a ballot would decide whether they were admitted or not. The references in the minute books note that the special, circum or note the special circumstances of the case um, and how it warranted a review of the rules as follows. That the rules relating to elections be and are, he and are hereby suspended so far as regards the election of Eleanor Annie Hill and Florence Jessie Hill, twins, duly qualified candidates with a view to their immediate admission into the institution. Their father having lost his life in the wreck of the White Star SS Titanic, and that they be and are hereby elected without ballot accordingly, subject nevertheless to all the laws and regulations pertaining to girls after the election. The notice of motion is significant as I believe it's the first example of the rules around election be, being suspended in this way. There are other later examples, including other Titanic cases and cases relating to fathers lost in the two world war, wars, but I can't recall seeing one before this point. The records don't give much away about the girls' time at the school on what it was like, although they do give the occasional glimpse stay tuned for my next example, but the registers of admission do indicate that Florence was appointed as a mathematics teacher at the school from September 1929, so I can only assume she enjoyed her time there so much she was reluctant to leave. So that's one of many stories from the girls, so not wanting to leave them out, I better move on to one from the boys. I promised you a glimpse of everyday school life in the records, so here goes. It's a tale which begins with three boys and their clandestine cheese thievery and ends with an Australian folk hero. Let me introduce you to Edwin Henry Murrant. His admissions register tells us uh, that he was born on the 9th of December 1864 in Bridgewater, Somerset. His father, also Edwin, had been master of the Bridgewater Union Workhouse and was a Freemason in Lodge of Virtue and Honour, number 494. Edwin Henry, recorded in error as Thomas Henry in the register entry, was admitted into the Royal Masonic Institution for Boys in September 1873. He never knew his father, who the register also tells us had died from rheumatic fever, inflammation of the heart and brain. My guess is that his mother's wage as a matron at the workhouse would not have been enough to support the family, so she turned to the Freemasons for help. Now, as I mentioned earlier, detailed references to particular pupils are rare in the school records that we have in the museum. Normally, when interrogating the indexes, the references relate to a name on the list of pupils uh, when they were admitted or when they're leaving the school. When it came to looking up our friend Edwin Murrant, the story was a little different. The first giveaway in the index was that his name appeared several times. It's always a good sign. Um, and when I checked the pages, it turns out I'd stumbled across a rather fantastic tale of schoolboy misdemeanor and ingenuity. 
The most detailed reference from the headmaster's report included in the minutes of the House Committee from September 1879 places Edwin and two other boys at the scene of a successful nighttime raid on the matron's storeroom. At the committee meeting, the headmaster began by reporting the flagrant misconduct of one of the three, a boy named Peter Bailey Heaviside, specifically manufacture of false keys, forcible entry into and extensive theft of articles from the Mason storeroom. It goes on to note that he punished Heaviside and others for coming downstairs after they were all in bed taking bread and cheese. The evidence against the ringleader Heaviside continues. 17th September, Heaviside again came downstairs after all were in bed and stole butter, plums, biscuits, matches, etc. Two forged keys were found upon him of his own make and to enable him to gain access to prohibited places. The example of such boy as Heaviside is most injurious to the younger boys after the return to school. It really does sound like Edwin had fallen in with the wrong crowd here. Edwin and the others were asked for an explanation for their behaviour. Heaviside stayed quiet, whilst Edwin and the third boy, Harry Pinson, were quick to express regret. This may have been what saved them, as the minute book entry continues with a suggestion that Peter Heaviside be summarily dismissed from the institution. Despite his remorse, the minutes tell us that Murrant was still to be severely punished and his mother was to be informed of his gross misconduct for which he had narrowly escaped expulsion. Now, I don't know about you, but my mum's wrath would be enough to scare me into behaving myself. Thankfully, there's no other evidence to suggest that Edwin got into any more trouble during his school days but it turns out that his adult life did more than enough to earn him his place in history books. Murrant, after a stint as a tutor back in Somerset, eventually emigrated to Australia, where he styled himself as an English aristocratic son of an admiral, rather than the humble son of a workhouse master he was. He went on to make a name for himself as a skilled horseman and a ballad writer, becoming better known to history as Harry Harbord or Breaker Morant. His story has been told very well by others, so I won't repeat it here. But if you are interested, I'd recommend looking at the 1980 film of the same name. I think there's also a, a, a play as well. Um, and searching out one of the several histories written about his time in Australia. So, that's all from me in terms of other people's stories from the records, but I wanted to finish by saying that if you went to one of the schools and are interested in finding out if we have anything on your particular story, then, or, or indeed anybody, uh, any of your ancestors, please feel free to get in touch via our website. We can search register entries, minute books, and case files for details and provide access to documents in our reading room uh, once we've got our uh, research area um, open again. There's also something very human about our school days. They tend to stick in our memories as a time when we learned much about the world around us and about ourselves. It's a real privilege to work with records like these and to get a glimpse into this unique period in the lives of those who've gone before. I hope you enjoyed exploring their stories with me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Louise. Bravo. Fantastic talk. That was really, really interesting. Goodness me, what a lot of interesting stories there from the school. Well done. <laughs> if you have a question for Louise, please post it in the chat. We will give you a, a little time to, um, to type. Louise, thank you so much. Um, I was wondering, can you tell us a bit about when did the museum actually start to collect records from the schools? So the, the school's records are sort of, uh, they're on loan from the Masonic Charitable Foundation. Um, so they, um, the, what happened was we got um, some funding for uh, some project catalogers to come in and uh, catalog the material that we've got from the MCF. 
Um, and there have been several projects there. We're up to sort of our third or fourth project archivist, I think now, um, for, the, for the school's material. Um, and we've had it, we've had projects on the go since about 2007, 2008. So when I, when I arrived, we already had a, a, a project archivist in place who'd done a bit of sorting. And one of the first things that I was tasked with doing was sorting out these petitions, uh, the girls' school petitions. And they were sort of, um, they were, they were all in, in random boxes. They weren't in any particular order. So we were going through putting them in a, putting them in a sensible order and, and working out what order they were supposed to be in in the first place, which is um, never quite straightforward uh, and uh, making a list of everybody's uh, kind of information. So we know what we had. Um, so yeah, we, it's, we've, we've had stuff since about 2007 and we've gradually been cataloging more and more of it over time. Goodness, that's a lot of work. Yeah, fantastic. Lots of work behind that. Louise, I have a great question for you in the chat here. Yeah. Does anything remain of the old school buildings nowadays? If so, what are the building used for now? Oh, now that's a good question. The, well, the girls school in Rickmansworth is still there and still open and, and still and you can uh, visit the website. It's now a, um, a fee paying school. So it's not um, exclusively for children of Freemasons. Um, so, or, you know, daughters of Freemasons. So it's, it's a general fee paying school that you can apply to and go to. Um, so um, the old, the older girls schools, I'm not sure. I'd have to do a bit of digging on that one. Um, the boys school, the old, um, the old boys school in, in Bushy um, has, has been, uh, has been sold uh, and isn't a school anymore. Um, so I think, I think it's uh, under redevelopment, but I don't know, to be honest, I don't know an awful lot about it. Um, but I know that, you know, um, I think um, there may have been some filming done there when it was closed and and uh, and things like that. But um, the the building is still there, um, but it's in the process of being redeveloped. The old boys' school, I believe. Oh. In terms of the older ones, I don't know. <laughs> I'd have I'd have to do a bit of digging. Uh, very interesting, um, Louise. Was it was it only Freemasons' children who could go to the schools? Um, initially. Uh, yes, I mean you. It was sometimes uh, you see um, records of rather than it's usually your father was a Freemason, but I have seen some examples of grandfathers as well. So there, as part of the application process, you had to kind of provide evidence of lodge membership. With um, you needed to provide kind of how long they were a member for and a, a kind of a recommendation from a lodge. Um, so, um, but that's not the case with the girls' school now. Um, and the the girls' school uh, removed the requirement for um, a father to be a Freemason in um, I think the 80s, something like that. Some somebody else will know the exact date, <laughs> um, I, and there are probably people watching who will know the exact date. The um, um, and the boys' school, they uh, they considered um, changing to being sort of a fee-paying school and, and letting in um, boys uh, who weren't sons of Freemasons, but they uh, they they didn't go through with it in the end. Uh, so it remained the kind of sons of Freemasons right up until it enclosed in the seventies. Right, very interesting. Um, Louise, a bit, a bit of an, uh, a funny question here, but an interesting yeah. one. Why was the girls' school uh, established before the boys' school? Because I, I guess we all think it would probably have been the other way around. That, that's, I don't, the, the short answer is we're never really going to know. Um, the, I think, I mean, I, if I was going to, if I was going to speculate, I would say that um, there was probably a sense that there was there was less educational provision for girls at the time that the school was founded. So there was a sense that they needed to be provided for slightly more than the boys. Um, the girls school um, was initially kind of set up to teach kind of the very basic education, sort of the three R's and, you know, how to run a house and all that, that sort of thing. Um, 
so um, yeah, I, I would I would guess that it was it was to f plug a hole. It was to it was to fill a gap um, in in education. Um, the the boys' school um, was they probably took their time over the boys' school because I I think they were uh, they weren't convinced um, about um, the cost about running a building because it actually takes it actually takes quite a lot to to uh, you know main, run and maintain a building so it took took a little bit of time for them to um, decide they were going to build it. Right, very good, very good. Uh, Louise, let's dive into some of the stories now. They were really sure. amazing. Uh, uh, I think we're all curious to know what exactly happened to our uh, chief thief, uh, Peter Heaviside. What happened to him? Well, I now I did. I did do a little bit of digging uh, as part of the for for the talk, and um, there's actually um, we had a researcher come in uh, a, a, a few years ago who was doing her family research, uh, and uh, you know her ancestor was was this chap Peter Heaviside, and um, there's a quite there's quite a comprehensive um, sort of ancestry timeline on him. And having had a bit of a look, uh, it turns out, I found this quite funny, it turns out that he um, went on to be like a wholesale confectioner. So the idea that somebody somebody spent his childhood nicking stuff from the uh, matron stores then went on to basically uh, own a sweet warehouse is just, <laughs> I think, that's fantastic. Um, I think it was also haberdashers as well. But there's a there's a note from sort of 1916 that the business was uh, dissolved. But I just there's some there's something quite funny about that. <laughs> there's something a little sweet about that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I I I that that amused me. Um, but there's there's uh, some, there, there's a, been a lot of family research, uh, family history research done done on him in particular. Um, and there's uh, like I say, there's quite a comprehensive. Um, family tree on on ancestry part of which was pieced together through a visit to us which is uh which is pretty good because you you do you do discover that the that the school records are kind of you know they're a small piece of somebody's life but that you know when people come in and do research with us they tend to sort of dip in and find particular bit i mean that's just family history research i suppose yeah. isn't it um you know you go to various okay. different great places. Di great digging there that was a great yeah. a great story <laughs> there there are lots of people also mentioning their connections uh to oh, the fantastic. in the chat so i'll save that for you that's really some amazing stories thank you so much um louise i also want to ask you about um you, you mentioned a few titanic cases in the archive do, do we know any other titanic related stories there's there's one that I've immediately been able to find. Um, and there's a, it's a chap called, um, it's the daughter of a chap called Edward Parsons, um, who was also uh, on the Titanic, obviously. Um, he was the chief storekeeper on, on the Titanic. Um, and he'd also worked on several of the other White Star liners. So he'd also worked on the Oceanic uh, and the Teutonic as well. And when uh, it, his his daughter was called Bethel, and uh, she and uh, we've got her we've got her petition, um, and that's also going to be going into the treasures exhibition when we do our sort of refresh. So uh, keep an eye out for that uh, online. I think we're refreshing at the end of the year. Um, there may be more, but or there may well have been more, but we don't have the petitions for them. Um, but those are the only two I those are the only two I found. Uh, but there are there are quite a few different sort of uh, Titanic resources available where you can find out more about various uh, various people. But I'd quite like to do a bit more digging in the records to see if Ethel did anything particularly interesting. Because having done a bit more digging about Florence, I discovered she was a mathematics teacher, oh. and but then she she went on to be a mathematics teacher, and I need to do some more digging to work out exactly how long she was teaching for and things um but mm -hmm. I, she was also a prefect as well so no wonder she went on to be a teacher <laughs> <laughs> oh brilliant that is brilliant um louise do we have any records about staff at the schools um 
we have a few kind of registers. It's a little bit ad hoc. So we have we have a few kind of chance survivals, um, but not for anything particularly early. Kind of discussions about staff tend to happen in the in the minute books rather than in kind of other formal books. Um, for the girls' school, there are, there are headmistresses reports, um, which are, which are pretty good. Um, there, there isn't an equivalent for the boys, as far as I'm as far as I'm aware. Um, so yeah, there are there are a few bits, but it's it's not comprehensive, um, and that's that's something else to say really is that there are quite a few gaps um, in you know, especially in um, petitions. And we've got a very good run for the girls, but the the boys it's a very small small amount. Um, oh, great, great to know, uh, Louise. Are there any Freemason school lodges? uh yes there are there are uh there's one main one which is the old masonians lodge uh for and for um old boys um and um it was formed in 1898 i believe um it was initially formed for for old boys but it's branched out a bit now uh so there are you know there, it's um any anyone can join um but there, there are, I think there are also sort of old Masonians lodges for different regions as well. So that I think there's one, there's a northern one and a Middlesex one and a, a West Lancashire one as well. Um, and if anyone knows of any more, do let me know. <laughs> um, those are the only ones I'm immediately aware of. Fantastic. Um, Louise, people are writing a lot about their own connection with the school, which is just so brilliant. I can't read it all out, I'm afraid, but thank you so much. They're fantastic stories and we will save them all, so thank you. Um, sure I'll be reading them. <laughs> definitely, it's fantastic. Uh, and this kind of answer this question as well, Louise, um, can people see their own records from the schools in our archives? Yes, yes they can. Um, the I mean, uh, we'd be able to sort of provide you with uh, more specifically with the girls as a start. Girls is a lot easier. So if you went to the girls school, there's a fairly there's a fair chance that we've got your original petition, um, which will be a, like a petition form with uh, copies of certificates, maybe medical reports um, that we've got. We've got a few that have like little handwriting tests in them that are really kind of sweet. <laughs> um and uh so yeah the supporting documentation um there's there may also be sort of references in minutes and things like that um for the boys school um like i say very short run of petitions so if you were, went to the boys school somewhere between 1970 and 1980 we might have your petition <laughs> um but otherwise uh, we do have a run of um case files which having said earlier in the talk that we don't have school reports, occasionally have school reports in them, um, but we're in the process of listing those and working out exactly what we've got. So by all means, make an inquiry. Um, the, the main point to, to make is that if you are making, uh, an in, that it's important that you're making an inquiry um, for yourself. So um, we can, um, only release kind of information to people who are inquiring on the, on their own behalf. If you're inquiring for somebody else uh, who's no longer with us, that's okay. But if the person you're inquiring about is still living, they'll need to make their own uh, approach to us. Right. Um, Louise, is there also something about the school magazines or the annual reports? Oh yes, yeah, we, we have, um, as well as archive material, we've got uh, a fair amount of printed material as well. Oh, right. uh, so this is, um, so in the library we have um, runs of old school magazines. Um, so they're not complete runs, um, but we have, um, we've got uh, Masonica, which is uh, the girls' school. So uh, that's, the, that's the old Masonic Girls Association magazine, um, but we don't have a complete run of that. Um, Macchio is the, the girls' school magazine specifically. Um, started in 1924, but again, we don't have a complete run of it, unfortunately. Um, the boys, um, we've got the Masonian, which is the school magazine, uh, and then it's got the old 
Smithsonian's Gazette in as well. Um, and, um, and then the old Smithsonian's Gazette runs on its own from about 1977. So, and they're a fairly complete run. Um, and then we've also got sort of histories of the schools um, and uh, sort of uh, promotional pamphlets and things like that. Fantastic. Lots of good sources there, Lou. Thank you so much. I'm afraid we are running out of time now, but I want to say a huge thank you to Louise for a fantastic talk. There's some brilliant research there. And thank you so much to all of you for joining us and for a lot of good questions and some uh, really interesting thoughts as well. It's really great to hear you, um, to hear you engage uh, in, in this way. It's fantastic to hear and we will save it all and go through it. Uh, I also hope that we may have the pleasure of your company again again uh, because we will be back on Monday the 7th of September at 7 30 p.m. British time with Mark Dennis our curator at the Museum of Freemasonry and Mark will talk us through how faces of the famous and not so famous came to feature on Masonic jewels as we explore some hidden portraits of the museum collection so please join us the link to register will be available on our website very soon it will also be our last live video talk for now, so please remember to tune in, but we hope to be back with another series later as we explore new exciting stories from our collection and our history. For now, thank you so much for joining us and have a nice evening. Thank you.